Jason. Good morning. Good morning. September 19th. Who knew it would be so comfortable and fall like? Oh, she says shush. <laughs> I'm just thinking this is the perfect day. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to welcome a new person here, Reverend Judith Brackett. Um, I've got a little bio here. And she sent most of this out, but I also investigated, you know, with the with the internet, you can and with LinkedIn and stuff. You went to the University of Maine. What did you major? Education. Oh, that explains some of this. Uh, Reverend, she she had a this is her second career. She was a classmate of Jonathan's at the Princeton Seminary. And so that's how we're lucky enough to have it. Um, but she taught. 20 years in the schools in New York, Philadelphia, and Bryn Mawr. And she taught mostly first grade. And one of the comments I love in this little bio is, so she's able to see the six-year-old in all of us. It's pretty evident in me most of the time. But uh, uh, She served three different churches in the Presbytery of Philadelphia and is launching a new theology of the table, which is intriguing, and I think we ought to have her back another time to talk to us about that. Uh, and it's from her home in Marburg, the only community in the Delaware Valley that I think comes close to being as nice as Lansdowne. Um, that's my personal view. So welcome, Judith. We're really honored to have you with us. Uh, other announcements? There are always other announcements. Please, please invite, continue to invite friends and neighbors to join us and come here. And uh, when we're still on the lawn, which looks like we'll be for a while, and later when we're not. So please invite them to come. The Deacons Fund will always enjoy your uh, gifts. Over under the portico, you will find green envelopes for the Deacons Fund. You will also find white envelopes that say you're offering on them and put your name and if you have a, a, a number in the accounting system, put that on it as well. Also under the portico, you will find a bullet, uh, a single sheet bulletin that ha will have the lyrics to the, to the uh, hymns on it. The food cupboard continues to be uh, grateful for your support. And during this month, we are collecting pasta and pasta sauce. So if you can remember to bring that, 
with you uh, and put it in the baskets just inside the door or just in, inside uh, Westminster Hall. Mission committee will be meeting today. Uh, Carmela, right here, right after the service or at 11.30. Right after the service. So uh, bring your chairs and form a circle on the, uh, on the driveway. The book group will be meeting tonight uh, online on Zoom to discuss cast. Uh, I was doing some reading on this yesterday and it's a fascinating premise, the whole notion of with us being one of the few countries in the world where there is still a, a fairly solid caste system. I know that, I know that uh, uh, Margaret will have something to say about this in a few minutes, but Community Day is coming up uh, Sunday, uh, October 10th, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And there are flyers, I'll show you, under the portico as well, that give you all the information, including how to uh, sign up for a flu shot. The flu shots are free. The Persian Health System will be administering them. Uh, and this, I'll, I'll leave the rest of the information to, uh, to Margaret to uh, give to you. The deacons will meet next Sunday. And the other meetings today are Presby players at 11.30 or I guess after the mission meeting. Uh, or I'm getting a serious head nod from Bill and a, 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 a no. So it's not meeting today. They've had enough on their plate already getting all this set up today. Um, Music and worship will meet on uh, Monday at seven o'clock on Zoom. And I sent out the, uh, the Zoom link and you should have it. And if you had it last time, you can still join us. And if you'd like it, get in touch with me and I will get the Zoom link to you. If you're at home, uh, remember a star six and you're or on your telephone, star six will toggle your uh, uh, audio on or off, and star nine will uh, allow you to raise your hand. And if you're at home, you should have your computer set to audio mute, camera off, and view speaker view. Now I'd like to introduce Margaret, Margaret Stevens. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Do we have any visitors? I know our um, pastor today is a visitor, but do we have any other visitors in the audience? Welcome, welcome. Um, I will bring you a blue sheet if, um, if you fill it out, then we'll have someone get in contact with you. As Jim mentioned, October 10th is our annual community day. Um, we're going to do flu shots, so I ask if you please register for the flu shot. Um, it just makes it easier so we know how many we need to get. Um, something else that we're going to do a little different this year is, um, I guess about two years ago, we had um, someone come and do a, a series of um, sessions around grief. Uh, we had a lot of loss in the church. Um, I think it was around the time that... Um, that um, Don Lewis and Jack and a couple other people passed away. So we had someone come and do some grief counseling. Um, I think it was about four weeks and it was really beneficial for the people that attended. So what we're gonna do this year, this is just gonna be on community day. Um, I have someone from the health system that does um, something around grief, grief and um, substance abuse and other other things is going to do a session that day during community day, an hour, and everyone is, you know, whoever feel that it would be beneficial to them, um, you're welcome to attend. We've had a lot of loss of long-term members um, since the pandemic, not due to COVID, but just, you know, other things. So I thought it would be beneficial if we had a session on that. 
Um, I think that's it. Um, Finance Committee did approve for us to get a moon bounce, so we will have a moon bounce. Uh, we'll get um, chips again from hers. They've agreed to donate chips, and Wawa has also agreed to donate um, um, donate some drinks. So it should be, a, hopefully the weather's nice because we uh, plan to do everything pretty much outside. So um, if we don't have any visitors, but welcome, welcome. And that's it for me. Thank you. Good morning. You'll see in the um, program, our stewardship message is from Lori Ambush. Um, she's speaking to us from Maryland, thanks to uh, the miracle of technology. <laughs> Hopefully my phone didn't break. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy. I'm happy to have the opportunity to be here virtually with you this morning to spend just a couple of minutes sharing some of my thoughts on stewardship and how they relate to this year's theme of We're Back. And for me, the theme of We're Back, and as Roger mentioned, we never really left, related really directly with how I felt about my faith over the past year and a half during the COVID pandemic. And this idea that you know, my faith never left, but I also experienced certain things that really gave me the opportunity to intentionally return to what it means to have faith and to be a steward of that faith and how we can invest our gifts and in growing it and sharing it with others. And I personally had an experience, as Bill mentioned, many people uh, experienced job loss, unexpected health costs, financial struggles, struggles with uh, child care, education. There were a lot of strains that we faced as a society over the past year and a half. And I personally uh, was part of a firm where they instituted what was supposed to be a temporary pay cut of 30%. And five months into that, all of my pre-planning for a situation like this, I realized wasn't enough. Um, I too experienced some unexpected health costs. And with the, the pay cut, I reached a point where I, I felt really in trouble and helpless. And my major reaction was to retreat mm -hmm. to myself and to my own defenses and see you know, how I can fix the situation. And when I realized I couldn't, I, at that point, you know, reached out to God and said, I, I don't know what my next step is here. And I realized at that point that, you know, all of this uh, attempt to control the situation myself and this, you know, faith in myself, I, I was really misplacing where, where I needed that faith to be. And honestly, miraculously, within a week, things started turning around. And, you know, it's almost as if there's a more powerful being who was in control and knew things that I couldn't, who started seeing me out of this dark place. And as I'm reflecting back on that and thinking of stewardship, I am also, you know, reminded of some of the struggles I had over this past year with, as I'm sure many of you also have had with health insurance. And, um, you know, this is an important thing that we, we have to invest in. And just like, you know, investing in savings is also important. I'm not suggesting that these things aren't important, but investing in stewardship is something that I personally feel that the, the return on the investment is really incomparable to some of these other things that I've, you know, I've been relying entirely on to get me through. Um, you know, with health insurance, you can pay quite a lot of money in each month and spend hours on the phone each month, which I normally do, and rarely see that investment back. But with stewardship, we have the joy of when we share our gifts back with the church and with our community, we don't only personally get to see that return on our investment and multiply, but 
we get to share that with others. And I think there's just a, a joy in that that's really special. And I'm, I'm focusing on sharing that joy and committing myself to that as much as I can this year. Um, now that I've had the, really the privilege of experiencing uh, a bit of a reminder that I needed of where my, my faith lies and what's important. So as you're all thinking about stewardship, maybe uh, you've had a similar experience to this and um, also feel compelled to kind of return the, the stewardship, return the faith back to the church and enjoy the process of seeing how it can enrich our own lives as well as the lives of all those, those around us. So thank you for sharing some of these thoughts with me and uh, I hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Lori. Please join me now in our, uh, our responsive call to worship. Oh God, who created us in love. Oh Jesus Christ, who redeemed this world in love. O oh, Holy Spirit, who moves this world towards its God-appointed end, move within us as we worship you. Amen. And now our prayer of invocation in unison. Let us pray. Almighty God, you created the heavens and the earth and humankind in your image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and to serve you with reverence and thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand if you are able and join in saying, Lord, speak to me that I may speak. In the hymnal number 426. Jesus Christ. I want to take a moment just to say a personal message. Um, thank you so much for hosting me this morning. I have to say between the blue sky and all of you on the green grass and all of the traffic 
that I keep seeing that's going by. You, to me, look like this is an uh, evangelism moment. The people driving by on the cars may be kind of forgetting that it's Sunday morning, but you got up and you came here. And I'm sure all of us have other things we could be doing. And you brought your own chairs. And here you are. Because the spirit of God is alive. And we have come to ascribe all praise to our God. Friends, if we don't tell the truth about who we are and what we've done, then the truth is not in us. So an important part at the very beginning of our worship time together is we tell the truth which is also known as the prayer of confession. So let us now confess our sins before God and one another. Praying together, merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. God, in your mercy. Friends, as far as the East is from the West, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. the prayer of illumination that we hear the word and live the word praying god source of all light by your word give light to our lives amen our gospel reading this morning can you hear me you're going to raise your hand if you can't and i'm going to talk even louder use my teacher voice our reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. It's chapter 9, and it's beginning with verse 30 and through 37. It actually says in um, verse 31 that Jesus was teaching his disciples. So it kind of tips this off. This was a lesson Jesus was directly teaching to his disciples. Listen for the word of God. They, meaning Jesus and the disciples, went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to even ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He 
sat down and he called the 12 and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word be the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts. Be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So to this very day, I have memories of being a five-year-old in kindergarten. I don't remember my teacher's name, but I do remember a game that my classmates and I played with her. One Friday afternoon, she rearranged our small wooden chairs into a large oval shape. All the chairs facing not in, but facing outward. She explained the rules of this new game that we were about to play, and then she invited all of us to come and sit down in each of the chairs. One chair, for each child. All of us were twittering with excitement in anticipation of how much fun we were going to have. My teacher placed a large vinyl record, remember those, on the turntable. And putting the phonograph needle on the record, the marching music began. Marching around a circle of chairs might not sound that exciting in this technological age of fast action computer animated games, but the simplicity of marching with my kindergarten classmates, believe me, we were very, very happy. Now the teacher had explained what would happen, but I didn't even fully yet realize she abruptly just stopped the music turned it off, and we all scurried to sit down in a chair, any chair. Now, it didn't necessarily had to be the one that you were sitting in at the start of the game. And we giggled, and we laughed to find ourselves rearranged, and then there we went. The music started up again, and we lifted our knees, mostly in time to the music. And when the music stopped, this time, there were not enough chairs for everyone. The children who didn't get a chair were out, out. They were no longer allowed to play. They had to move away from the game to the edges of the room, away from the marching, away from the kids who still got to play and watch from the sidelines. Well, panic rose in my five-year-old heart as the music once again began to play. And when it stopped, oh, there was noticeably more rushing and pushing in the scramble to claim an empty chair. I don't remember the round when I was out. I didn't cry, though I do remember one girl who did. I can still see my smiling kindergarten teacher standing next to that record player. Did she really think that we were having the time of our lives? Were we supposed to be having fun on high alert that the music would stop? The fear of being eliminated out and that frenzy to get a chair first and foremost for yourself with no regard for anyone else. Okay. Am I exaggerating? It's just musical chairs. Isn't it just a harmless children's game that provides a little fun for a time? 
I remember that after playing this special game on Friday afternoons in kindergarten, I remember when I then played and I'd march to the music, but with a lot of caution. I'd be really careful not to ever be marched too far away from a chair, focused on what I made sure I needed to get. And I was posturing for an advantageous position. Friends, that's what the disciples were doing when they were arguing out of earshot of Jesus. They were posturing for an advantageous position, competing against each other, competing for the title of the greatest. And yikes, yikes, Jesus had caught them in a verbal game of musical chairs, arguing among themselves about who is the greatest. The disciples were establishing a pecking order which of them was the best? Which disciple deserved a chair? The chair closest to Jesus. We too, disciples of Jesus, fall into living our lives as if we are living a grown up game of musical chairs. We're fearful. But there might not be enough good to go around, so we better grab what we can so we don't lose out. Believing at any moment that the blessings in our life will just stop, like the music stops. So we better get while the getting is good. And absolutely participating in a way that we have to compete against the other guy, no matter the cost. Yikes. Yikes, said Jesus then, and yikes, says Jesus today. Living with a me-first mindset is not the way of discipleship. It's not the way of the one who follows Jesus, and our great teacher shows us another way. Like a referee calling a timeout, Jesus sat down and he called the disciples to gather around him. And he patiently taught them, this time using different words to make plain what he needed them to understand. Jesus taught the disciples new rules. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then to demonstrate this teaching, Jesus invited a child to come closer. And lifting the child in his arms, he spoke these words. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The biblical scholars point out that children at this time in history were of very low status. Children were considered not yet adults, and they were counted as property of the male head of the household. So in this context, by choosing to lift up and elevate a child, Jesus was lifting up the unnoticed, the ones with no honor and no status. Serve these first. And last of all, Jesus taught, serve yourselves. Welcome the overlooked, the forgotten, those of low status. Do this, Jesus taught, and you will be welcoming me and the one who sent me. Do this and you will flip the script of discipleship. Jesus was teaching them new ways of being together. Now, when I think of new ways of beginning to being together, I remember an idea that gained some popularity when I was an elementary school teacher. The author Vivian Paley wrote a book called, You Can't Say You Can't Play. You can't say you can't play. 
And the book advocated this rule, this generous way of being with and for one another. So you can't say you can't play was meant to promote inclusive behavior among children. No one could be left out. The author explained that following this rule benefits both those who were rejected and also those who did the rejecting. This rule, you can't say, you can't play, was adopted by two different schools where I taught. Now I will admit that in practice, this rule defied the natural pecking order of children's play. It felt some days as if this rule was a misguided attempt to fix human nature. And the rule was naive about how it really was on a playground. Yet most of the time, the rule saved children. The children who needed help standing up to mean-spirited exclusion. And the children who needed a place in the social realm of their school day. And I need to tell you that enforcing the rule consistently was not easy. It was not always easy to shoehorn a child into an ongoing game. Children who already were had engaged in play would protest. We already have enough people that say. We already started, we don't wanna start over. Well, sometimes when we let them in, they, they wanna change up the rules. And I would have to stop and help them figure out how to include an additional playmate or two. Oh, and those kind of adjustments, it used up precious recess time. We all learned that it wasn't easy to make room for the other. So the author of the book remarked, she remembered that there was one child who was totally objecting to this rule and said, look, this might be a fairer way to play, but how are we gonna have any fun? And you've got to admire the unvarnished truth of that question is to welcome the other who we would rather not can be difficult. Creating new ways of being together is not always fun and games. So we have to remember, regardless of our age, we are all children of God. In every act of welcome, we are practicing what Jesus taught us to do. The one who sent him wants us to know you can't say, you can't play. The lesson Jesus taught his disciples that day when he drew a child toward him in welcome forever changed the rules of the game. His disciples were learning new ways of engaging the outcast, the marginalized, and the forgotten new ways of being together, new expectations of what it means to win. And so too for us, disciples of Jesus today, we are invited into a life of faith that defies what we learned when we played musical chairs. Because of Jesus Christ, no one is out. We must enlarge our welcome and live in the spirit of God's abundance, not scarcity, abundance. All are welcome to participate in what God is doing in the world. They don't need our permission. Everyone belongs and all are promised a place of welcome. That's good news, friends. It's very good news. Because of Jesus Christ, everybody has a chair a God-given chair, a chair with your name on it, a chair that you don't have to earn or guard, a chair prepared for you before you were born. And because of Jesus Christ, the music never ends. There's not a time when Jesus will lift the needle from the record, stop the music, and you're left to fend for yourself. In Christ, we can rely on the promise that we are never left out or left alone. 
Sisters and brothers, Jesus Christ is a game changer, makes all things new, start to finish. Christ brings a new game, new rules, and as his disciples, we get to play and welcome others to play too. May it be so. Amen. So whether you put your offering in the place here under the portico or use Tithely or mailed it or dropped it off, with gladness, let us present to God the offerings of our life and labor. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love the prayers of the people. I feel like with all the promises and all the theology that's above our heads, when this is when it gets personal, when we name names and we remember what we carry on our hearts and we say them aloud and we think them to ourselves and we bring them to God. This morning, let us remember the people of Haiti who are struggling, intense poverty, all of the disasters, the natural disasters that have followed, that have plagued them, the food insecurity and the fear, they need our love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember the people of Afghanistan, so many that are fleeing a land, they're fearful and afraid. They need our prayer especially the women there, women and girls who are most at risk. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And here now, let me read the names of those in our congregation who need our prayer this morning. B. Bradford, Zach Carries, Dave Wilson, Derexa Kosneth, Joe and Nancy Timothy. Also the Tang family, Lord, in your mercy. Are there other prayers at this time that you wish to lift up? You would raise your hand. Yes. Can you say those names? Names, say them again, nice and loud. Lord, in your mercy. Anyone else? Anyone else? Is there anyone on Zoom? No, no. No? There's no chat. Friends, that sometimes the prayers that are in our hearts are still just sort of a feeling down deep and haven't even made it to the world word level. And so we trust in prayers spoken as well as prayers felt. Lord, in your mercy, hear those prayers. Let us pray. Holy one who was and is and forever will be, we lift our hearts to you in praise for the mercies of a new day, for the turning of the seasons, for all creatures of the earth. You created the world and pronounced it good. And with full hearts, we praise the many wonders of your creation. Healing one who was and is and forever will be, 
hear the worries and fears that we lay at your feet. For people who live with disabilities, a body, mind, and spirit. For the poor who worry daily about what they will eat, where they will live, and how they will pay their bills. For acts of war and terrorism that cause us to shudder. Help us to remember your power to work miracles and trusting our lives to your wisdom and healing. Eternal one who was and is and forever will be, thank you for sending your message to us in the person of your son, Jesus, your word made flesh. In sending Jesus, you taught us a new way of being together forever changing the rules. Open our eyes to see who you want us to notice. Empower us to follow you that we welcome others and find ourselves welcomed again. Grant us the wisdom and the willingness to be last. Encourage us to do the will of the one who sent us Jesus who while he was on earth taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory for us. Amen. Friends, let us rise in body or in spirit and sing our closing hymn, Lord, whose love through humble service. <laughs> in Christ, go out into the world in peace. We have courage 
and return no one evil for evil, honor all persons with no exceptions. And you live the life of discipleship to which we are called, playing by the rules that Jesus taught us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the spirit of the and the spirit, the Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.